Hello and welcome to this clip summarising the relationship between haloalkanes and the environment. It's designed to go with the clip on the introduction to haloalkanes, which covers things like uh, their naming, their structure and nucleophilic substitution. This clip focuses specifically on the connection between haloalkanes and the ozone layer, or more specifically ozone depletion in recent decades. And to give it some context, although it's not necessarily going to be in any exam specifications, uh, sources of, C of the CFCs, what these compounds are, and how their use is now controlled by international environmental laws. So, as always, at any time, please feel free to pause and rewind the video clip to look at something again to clarify it in your mind. At the end of the clip, we'll do a, a couple of worked exam questions. So a little bit of background on ozone. Um, it's basically an allotrope or an elemental version of oxygen. In a similar way that diamond graphite, graphene and buckminster fullerene are all different versions of carbon. So it's a gas that if you were to breathe it in it's actually quite toxic. It can be produced um, down here on Earth, on the Earth's surface, by uh, things like diesel engines and electrical equipment and it, uh, it does, co does actually contribute to things like asthma and uh, bronchitis and respiratory problems. However, it's got an, an absolutely vital protective role in the terms of the ozone layer, which is a naturally formed layer of ozone up on, uh, in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere to be exact. And the reason ozone forms so easily closer to where the sun is is that it's the UV light actually causes the O3 molecule to break up and produce oxygen radicals and O2. So the first thing to happen is that oxygen molecules actually break up under the influence of UV light to form oxygen radicals. So you start off with O2 and this produces two free oxygen atoms like that. So you have O2 reacting with your oxygen radical and this is an equilibrium so it's reversible to make O3. Now the O3 is the ozone so if we now have a look at this animation, which tries to illustrate this process, you can see that radiation from the sun actually breaks up um, oxygen molecules. And the oxygen molecule that breaks up into an oxygen atom, or an oxygen radical, the oxygen radical can then go and attack the other oxygen atom now to create ozone. So I'll, what I'll try and do is I'll time my narration so UV hits oxygen uh, uh, molecule, oxygen atom produced, ozone made. So that's one part of the reaction. We now have to look at the remaining part. So then we know that ozone naturally breaks up under sunlight, but it can also replenish as well because it's an equilibrium. It goes backwards as well as forwards. Now, if something were to enter the atmosphere from Earth that disrupts this process then what's going to happen is the whole balance of the ozone layer is going to be um, skewed and, and disrupted in some way. And that's going to threaten our well-being here on Earth because the UV radiation that I was referring to earlier will now make it through the ozone layer because there will be less ozone to reflect it back or to absorb it. So what we've got to look at now is what sort of chemicals or what sort of pollutants might actually do this, what, what, what sort of pollutants might disrupt the ozone layer. So a CFC is a compound that's made of carbon as its base, as its skeleton. Uh, there'll be some chlorine and there'll be some fluorine in there as well. Now carbon halogen bonds have different bond enthalpies. So looking at the two examples in the diagram and using the theory, the idea at the bottom left hand corner of the screen, so these two equations will be one way in which you could actually um, illustrate how these individual carbon uh, car fluorofluorocarbons would break up. So obviously you get a series of possible, um, these will be the initiation stages, you get a series of possible propagations as well. So if we look at the initiation step for each of the chlorofluor chlorofluorocarbons in the picture, uh, you'll see it's slightly different, but the main thing that you need to notice 
is in each case it produces a chlorine radical. And that chlorine radical goes on to attack ozone. It starts to react with ozone and produces ClO dot plus O2. Uh, so the same pro propagation step takes place no matter what the actual chlorofluorocarbon. So the problem is that all chlorofluorocarbons, no matter what their actual formula is, if they have chlor carbon-chlorine bonds, that breaks up to produce the Cl radicals. And if you look at the Cl radical at the start and at the end, you can see it's regenerated. So therefore, the first thing to look at is that the chlorine radical catalyzes the reaction. So what we need to look at now is an animation of the reaction to help you see what's going on. And what I'll put at the bottom is also a, uh, an overall equation. So this animation shows the process quite well, and it uh, tells you what happens. It has the sun in it to show you that it's a UV from the sun that's actually causing this. Um, but it's quite interesting to look at it. You can see quite visually that um, one single chlorine atom can actually, or chlorine radical, rather, can actually go on and re-attack fresh ozone over and over and over again. They actually estimate that this takes um, about 10 years um, for a chlorine radical, an individual chlorine radical, to stop doing this because it dissipates, because it's just something that can keep going on and on and on. They think that one chlorine radical can do this up to 100,000 times to 100,000 separate ozone molecules. So you can see how quite easily a small amount of CFCs released into the atmosphere can create a very, very large problem for a long time to come. This is why we have to be aware of this reaction so that we can think about what to do about it. So anything that uh, needs, needs it, some kind of propulsion system, uh, not necessarily a mechanical propulsion system as such, but a propellant, in other words, a substance that helps another substance get moving in some way. Um, generally, they used to use CFCs before they realised that these were a problem. So examples of such things would be deodorant sprays, fire extinguishers and refrigerators. So you can see from the photograph on the left the CFC recovery area. These are obviously old fridges and freezers that have been left specially and collected by local authorities uh, so that the CFCs don't leak into the atmosphere. Uh, the fire extinguishers, um, the full use of CFCs and fire extinguishers is being phased out at the moment. And in deodorant sprays, it's been banned from being used in deodorant sprays for at least 15 years. And all of this came from an, an international agreement called the Montreal Protocol. It was first signed in 1999. It's undergone several new revisions um, since then. The most recent one was in 2007. So although the Montreal Protocol might not necessarily be part of your examination, and it might not necessarily be part of your specification, it's worth having a quick think about it, just so you can see some context behind the chemistry of CFCs. So what has this achieved? So if you look at the graph on the right hand side of the screen, it's a projection of what would have happened if there was no Montreal Protocol, the red dotted line, and what the effective projection of reduction in free chlorine. So what they mean by effective chlorine is basically chlorine radicals. So the number of chlorine radicals up in the stratosphere that can continue destroying ozone is projected to, to diminish rapidly from about now through to 2030 and to continue doing so as a result of the Montreal Protocol. So the Montreal Protocol has been seen as, as one of the great success stories of international cooperation to, uh, to improve the environment for all of us. So in your specification, um, it'll obviously, if you look in your textbook, you'll see that there's other things that can cause ozone depletion as well, some of which are produced by natural um, processes, some of which are produced by human activity. So it's worth having a look at them too. So nitrogen monoxide, as you can see from its diagram there, has an unpaired electron. And that unpaired electron means that it can essentially be treated as this. So as a result, it can undergo some reactions with ozone 
and cause the same or similar problems to the chlorine radical. So you can see quite clearly that the NO radical or the nitrogen monoxide um, molecule is the catalyst here and the overall reaction is very similar if not identical to the one we looked at before. So let's have a look at some sources of nitrogen oxides like this, uh, natural and otherwise. So obviously um, lightning has been taking place since, well, since the birth of the, of the early atmosphere of the Earth. And what, nitrogen, uh, what lightning does is actually retains the balance of nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. They're actually a natural, um, a natural compound or set of compounds. The problem is when human activities such as pollution from vehicles and airplanes and trucks starts to put, to, to put more and more nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere. Nitrogen oxides themselves are actually quite toxic and in many places they can actually cause the production of ozone at ground level which can create some quite serious health problems such as um, things like asthma, bronchitis and many respiratory problems that I mentioned earlier. And that idea is summarised quite nicely by this, uh, this image here. OK, so I think it's time to have a look at an exam question or two, perhaps. So, on the next screen, I'll put a question up. And what I'd like you to do is pause and see if you can ever think about some of the things that it's asking before you um, play any further and we go and look at the answers. So this is a mixed question from several different years. And basically it pulls together all the stuff that we've just been looking at. So it has a little bit of nitrogen oxides in there, and it's also got um, something on CFCs, which requires you to, to know how each of them causes ozone depletion. So like we said earlier, nitrogen monoxide has an unpaired electron, so it can behave as a radical. So that would be the obvious thing to put in the first answer. So in this next one, um, they're actually pretty much telling you what to do. They don't, you don't even have to think too hard. If you look at this sentence here, where it says nitrogen monoxide reacts with oxygen to form NO2, that's almost like a recipe for what to write. So all you really have to do there is think about how to balance it, because the question tells you what to write. You just have to convert that to um, formulae and put them together into a balanced equation. So the next one says, airplane engines produce nitrogen monoxide. And it says, describe with the aid of equations how nitrogen monoxide catalyzes ozone depletion in the stratosphere. This one's a little bit more subtle. What you're looking at here is, with the aid of equations, that would suggest, and because it's equations plural, there's more than one you need. And also the fact it says it catalyzes. So your equations must show that nitrogen monoxide is regenerated like we talked about before. So this one requires a little bit of thinking. So our first um, two marks comes from doing the equations they asked for. Uh, so we start off with nitrogen monoxide reacting with ozone to produce nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. And the nitrogen dioxide goes and reacts with an oxygen atom that was released when the ozone was broken up and produces NO again. So the idea that NO is regenerated in the two equations is important. So the way to get the third mark would be to cover yourself by saying that nitrogen oxide is not consumed or not used up and give the overall reaction that we looked at before. So although it might look like I'm saying two things for my third mark, what I'm actually doing is trying to cover my tracks so that if the third mark was for saying that nitrogen monoxide was not used up, I'm covered. And if the mark happened to be for doing the overall equation, which by definition would mean I'd have to recognise that I'd have to cancel out nitrogen monoxide there and there, in other words, showing that it's used up, or sorry, not used up, then um, either way, I've got my marks so far. So the third one says, explain with the aid of equations how the presence of CFCs in the upper atmosphere also leads to ozone depletion in the stratosphere. Now if you remember, we ended up proving, didn't we, that the overall reaction is the same whether you're having nitrogen monoxide as your, your catalyst or whether you're having chlorine radicals as your catalyst. 
So the answer is going to involve O3 plus O going to 2 O2 somewhere in it again. So as it doesn't specify which CFC we have to work with, we can choose one we've looked at before. So I've just chosen CF2 CL2 at random because that was one of the ones in the images we looked at earlier. So I've put down my initiation step and I now need to say what happens next. So obviously we know that the CL dot is the catalyst so that goes and attacks the ozone. So I've put my two propagation steps clearly showing that the chlorine radicals are regenerated. So just to cover myself yet again, I'm going to put the overall equation and I'm going to say chlorine radicals are not used up, just like I did in part C. So I've said everything I can possibly say. I've made two conclusions. I've used the propagation steps to justify those conclusions and I've done the initiation step to justify the propagation steps. So that should cover you in these types of questions um, if you put the equations down and say what they mean, not one or the other. Some mark schemes might allow you to get away with one or the other, but why take the risk? Okay, so hopefully you found this video clip fairly useful. Um, like I would say, do rewind and have another look if you need to check anything over one more time or come to one of us in college for some support, go and see a teacher, bring some questions to our subject extension. Thanks for listening and all the best. Bye.